Welcome everyone and welcome to folks just joining. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes here. Thanks, Heidi and Susan and Tim. It was wonderful and strange on Christmas Eve to be in the building with a congregation there. And a strange thing to begin a new ministry and to have led so many services with you already and for this still to be the first ones inside the building. It's a good thing. Welcome, everyone. It's awfully good to be together. I was joking as we were getting ready with um, with Steve and Don and Jennifer that it might just be the four of us this morning. <laughs> it's, it's good to see all of you, too. And so let us begin. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Boulder on this day after Christmas. My name is Steve Todd, and I'm very pleased to be your worship leader for today's service. We welcome all at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Boulder. All of you are welcome, and all of you are sacred. Whatever your past was like, whatever this present moment is like for you, we invite you to journey into the future together. This coming Sunday, January 2nd, in-person Sunday services are scheduled to return. Attendance in person requires sign up in advance. Check your weekly email for the link. It's restricted to those who are fully vaccinated. Going forward, at 9 a.m., there will be an in-person only service. Notice 9 o'clock, not 9.15 as it uh, was in the past. And then the 11 a.m. service will be in person and live streamed online. But for this service today, welcome all of you who are joining us via the magic of the internet once more. The chat box will be open if you need to get a message to us. If you are a new online visitor, please email our office administrator, Amy Zen, and let us know how you found us. You will find her email listed in the Zoom chat now. Our church website also has a great deal of information about UUCB, our programs, and our activities. Now, please ensure that your microphones remain muted 
as you join with the others gathered for worship. Good morning. It is awfully good to be together with you this morning online. Next year, Sunday the 25th, Christmas Day is a Sunday service. So next year, I'm going to invite all of you to come to church in pajamas. And some of you may already have done that this morning. So this will be our annual tradition of pajamas at church on Christmas Sunday. It's the day after Christmas. It's traditionally Boxing Day, a day to share with those less fortunate. But despite the call of post-holiday sales, despite the need maybe for post-Christmas house cleaning, despite maybe the quiet that sometimes comes after a holiday, we are gathered here today for a cozy morning of song and old stories and good company. I'm glad to be together with you all. I'd hoped this morning that we would hear from the Reverend Rory Castle Jones, who's a friend and a Welsh Unitarian minister serving a chapel near Swansea founded in 1692. There are, uh, I think, a couple of dozen of uh, Welsh Unitarian chapels, but Rory's been fighting a cold all week, so he can't be with us. After the service, though, I will drop in the chat an absolutely silly and delightful video that he made. They did an all dog nativity. So that will come at the very end of the service. We'll hear instead, though, some nostalgia of the Welsh poet Dylan Thomas speaking of his childhood Christmas in Wales, along with other stories. So refill your coffee, find something fuzzy to wear, put your pajamas back on again with the cat on your lap, and settle in. And we'll begin with this dark of winter shared from Christopher Watkins Lamb, who is just up the road from us at Foothills Unitarian and produced this in the midst of the pandemic last year.
The story that I have to share with you this morning is called The Gift of Nothing. The Gift of Nothing. And I thought that I would tell it with some help. This is Pilot. Pilot. Hey, come on up. Up, up, up. Whoa, not that way. Don't show them my messy house. Pilot, up. Good dog. All right. Pilot, do you know this story? Do you know The Gift of Nothing? You don't know the gift of nothing? This is a really good story. Okay. Sit. Good dog. Down. You can just sit. Yeah, there you go, buddy. Okay. Here we go. Here's how it goes. Have you heard this before? I don't think you've heard this before. It was a special day, Pilot. It was a special, special day. And Mooch, the cat, wanted to give Earl the dog, like you, a gift. But what to get Earl? Earl had a bowl, Earl had a bed, and Earl had a chew toy, which is, which is really the essentials, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a yes. Mooch thought and thought and thought, what do you give to someone who has everything? And at last, he figured it out. He would give Earl the gift of nothing. But in this world, filled with so many somethings, where do you find nothing? Where do you find nothing by? Mooch often heard Frank, the human that he lived with, say that there was nothing on TV. But as far as Mooch could tell, there was always something on TV. And Mooch often heard Doozy, the small human who he lived with, say that there was nothing to do. But as far as he could tell, they were always doing something. <laughs> Millie came home from the store, the other large human who we lived with, and said there was nothing to buy. So Mooch went shopping. Mooch went to the store and looked up and down every single aisle. But he found many, many, many somethings. Milton the cat is attempting to make an appearance also. He found so many somethings. He found the latest this and the newest that, but as far as he could tell, nothing was not for sale. Pilot, you need to let Milton the cat be himself, yes. Nothing was not for sale, so Mooch went home. Mooch went home and he sat on his pillow and he stayed very, very still like cats sometimes do. Not like that cat is doing right now, but like cats sometimes do. And in that stillness, not looking for it, he found nothing. He found the nothing stillness that comes when you sit very quietly. He found the nothing that is full of life and activity that comes when you sit still, just exactly like this pilot, right? So he got a box and he put nothing in it. And then Mooch thought, gosh, maybe Earl the dog deserves more than that. So he got a bigger box and he put nothing in it. That's plenty of nothing, he said at last. And on Christmas morning, Mooch the cat handed the great big wrapped box to Earl the dog and Earl unwrapped it and said, Mooch, you didn't have to get me anything. Who told him? Thought Mooch. Hey, buddy. Hmm. All right. That's, that's the peaceable kingdom of lions and lambs in this house. Um, who told him Earl opened Mooch's gift? The, uh, the, uh, there's nothing here, said Earl. Yeah, said Mooch, nothing, nothing, nothing but you and me. And so Mooch and Earl stayed still and enjoyed nothing and everything. And that pilot, that's the story of the gift of nothing. What do you think? Sometimes it's not the things that we need. It's just the people and the companionship and the occasional scratches behind the ears. Good dog.
If you are joining us online and have a candle or chalice near your computer, please get ready now to light it. We invite you to type into the chat box where your chalice is lit, the street or neighborhood, or what city, if you're joining us from outside of Boulder no. County. And so now I invite Don Lilly to light this morning's chalice. Good morning, dear friend. I'm Don Lilly, a member of UC, UUCB for about the last 15 years and Unitarian for 55 years. I'm going to talk briefly about joy. During the holiday season, we often see and hear the word joy. Joy comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes, some brief, some long lasting, some meaningful, others not so much, others simple, others complex, a pre prelude to great things or a potential disaster. Joy is impossible to box and is unique for each of us. It just is. We feel the acceleration. It could be the birth of a child, the centerpiece of Christian worship, likewise for a mother and family. A grandchild rushing to you screaming, grandpa, grandpa, as we scoop them up for hugs and kisses. A good cup of coffee, with your best friend or significant other. Winning the Powerball jackpot, uh, that's debatable. A small, meaningful gift, either given or received. Catching and releasing the biggest trout you've ever caught. Uh, see Tom Denkenwolf for details on that. An evening with uh, friends and family meeting a long lost friend unexpectedly, a sermon from Reverend David that resonates with us. We could go on, go on endlessly. The point is that there is joy everywhere if only we recognize it and catch it, if only for a moment or two. I like this chalice with the hope that each of us experiences a bit of joy today and every day. Give me, give me the light. We now invite all those gathered in your various locations to join together in fellowship and community as we say aloud our congregation's covenant. You may unmute and we will share the chaos. I will read slowly, but it won't sound in unison. <laughs> we gather in fellowship speak truth to each other, to reach out and touch one another, to care, care with each other and to seize the truth by fine. So be it. And now please remute. <laughs> hmm. Our words for meditation this morning are from the poet Jan Richardson. She has a marvelous book of blessings and blog and uh, I go to her often. She writes this, she says, I was having an Advent chat recently with my friend, Father Rob Lord, which he's the rector of a church that's been a place of solace for me in recent months. She says, Father Rob's a soul of insight and grace and his office adjoins the church playground. And as we talked on that afternoon, an angel periodically bobbed up in the window, complete with tinsel halo and cardboard wings, and then for a bit of flair, a Rudolph red nose also. Well, the angel appeared from time to time as Father Rob and I talked of such things as Advent and grief, seasons and time and eternity. 
The conversation turned to St. John of the Cross, the medieval Spanish mystic, known particularly for his stunning writings about the dark night of the soul. Father Rob said, in the language of his tradition, God is radiantly illuminating us in ways we cannot see or feel or know. And on that afternoon, with the shimmering, cardboard-winged, Rudolph-nosed angel at play on the other side of the window, I tucked those words into my heart. Something or someone, the holy illuminating us in ways we can't see or feel or know. And she continues now, writing this in the dark hours as Christmas Eve turns into Christmas Day. I pass the words along to you in the company of this blessing. In these hours, in these days, though we cannot see or feel or know all the ways we are being radiantly illuminated, may we open ourselves toward that light, however we understand it. May we open our eyes, our hands, our hearts to meet it. And may we lean into the light that begins in the deepest dark, bearing itself into this world. Where the light begins, a blessing for Christmas. Perhaps it does not begin. Perhaps it is always. Perhaps it takes a lifetime to open our eyes, to learn to see what has forever shimmered in front of us. The luminous line of the map in the dark, the vigil flame in the house of the heart. The love so searing we cannot keep from singing, from crying out in praise and in grief. Perhaps this day will be the mountain over which the dawn breaks. Perhaps we will turn our face toward it, toward what has been always. Perhaps our eyes will finally open in ancient recognition, willingly dazzled, illuminated at last. Perhaps this light begins in us today. We'll be together in silence for seven breaths. In this community, we deliberately practice the work of not moving through our lives alone. And as much as I feel, and maybe you do too, that the world so often tells us to bottle up your feelings, to keep them quiet, not to be too joyful in your joys, and not to let the tears out for your sorrows in this community we deliberately practice the undoing of those things, share our lives with each other, share the joys and the sorrows that we carry. So as the music begins, I invite you to share that, share your grief, share your hope, share your excitement, share your worry as much as you wish in the chat. Our music is from a friend and harpist back in Chicago. And I'll start sharing the screen here. Let's try that again. Here we go. Thank you. 
for all those blessings and concerns and all those that remain silently on our hearts. We hold this compassionate space with love. Friends, thank you for the ways that you bless each other and care for each other. Thank you for keeping at the center of this community, our community and relationship with each other. And the ways that you hold tenderly and celebrate happily the griefs and the joys, even of folks you don't know yet or know very well. I'm grateful to be part of this community that lives life that way. Amen. Well, our words this morning are to retell an old and delightful story. This is from Dylan Thomas's A Child's Christmas in Wales. And it is an invitation back into the coziness of home. An invitation into nostalgia in a way, a yearning to return back to a place of coziness and belovedness. A Child's Christmas in Wales by Dylan Thomas. One Christmas was so much like the other in those years around the sea town corner now, all out of sound except the distant speaking of the voices I sometimes hear a moment before sleep. And I can never remember whether it snowed for six days and six nights when I was 12, or whether it snowed for 12 days and 12 nights when I was six. All the Christmases roll down toward the two-tongued sea like a cold and headlong moon bundling down the sky that was our street. And they stop at the rim of the ice-edged, fish-freezing waves, and I plunge my hands in the snow and bring out whatever I can find. In goes my hand into that wool-white, bell-tongued ball of holidays resting at the rim of the carol-singing sea. And out comes Mrs. Prothero and the Fireman. It was on the afternoon of the day of Christmas Eve, and I was in Mrs. Prothero's garden waiting for cats with her son, Jim. It was snowing. It was always snowing at Christmas. December, in my memory, is white as Lapland, although there were no reindeer. But there were cats, patient, cold, and callous, our hands wrapped in socks. We waited to snowball cats, a thing I do not recommend to any of you, sleek and long as jaguars and horrible whiskers, spitting and snarling. They would slide and sidle over the white back garden walls. And Jim and I, fur-capped and moccasined trappers from Hudson Bay, would hurl our snowballs. No, the wise cats never appeared. The wise cats never appeared. But we were so still, such muffled silence of the eternal snow, eternal ever since Wednesday, that we never heard Mrs. Prothero's first cry from the bottom of the garden. Or if we heard it at all, it was to us like a far off challenge of our enemy, the neighbor's polar cat. But the voice soon grew louder. Fire! cried Mrs. Prothero, and she beat the dinner gong, and we ran down the garden with snowballs in our arm toward the house, and smoke, indeed, was pouring out of the dining room, and the gong was bombolating, and Mrs. Prothero was announcing ruin like a town crier in Pompeii. This was better than all the cats in Wales standing on the wall in a row. We bounded into the house, laden with snowballs, and stopped at the open door of the smoke-filled room. Something was burning all right. Perhaps it was Mr. Prothero who always slept there after midday dinner with a newspaper over his face, but, but he was standing in the middle of the room, saying, a fine Christmas, and smacking at the smoke with a slipper. Call the fire brigade, called Mrs. Prothero as she beat the gong. They won't be here, said Mr. Prothero. It's Christmas. Well, there was no fire to be seen, only clouds of smoke 
and Mr. Prothero standing in the middle of them, waving his slipper as though he were conducting. Do something, he said. And we threw all our snowballs into the smoke. I think we missed Mr. Prothero and ran out of the house to the telephone box. Let's call the police as well, Jim said. Mm, in the ambulance. Ooh, let's call Ernie Jenkins. He really likes fires. But we only called the fire brigade. And soon the fire engine came, and three tall men in helmets brought a hose into the house, and Mr. Prothero got out just in time before they turned it off. Nobody could have had a noisier Christmas Eve. And when the firemen turned off the hose and were standing in the wet, smoky room, Jim's aunt, Miss Prothero, came downstairs and peered in at them. Jim and I waited very quietly to hear what she would say to them. She said the right thing always. She looked at the three tall firemen in their shining helmets, standing among the smoke and cinders and dissolving snowballs. And she said, would you like anything to read? Years and years ago, when I was a boy, when there were wolves in Wales, and birds the color of red flannel petticoats whisked past the harp-shaped hills, when we sang and wallowed all night and day in caves that smelt like Sunday afternoons in damp front farmhouse parlors, and we chased with the jawbones of deacons, the English and the bears, before the motor cars, before the wheel, before the duchess-faced horse, when we rode the daft and happy hills bareback, it snowed and snowed. But here, a small boy says, it snowed last year too. I made a snowman and my brother knocked it down and I knocked my brother down and then we had tea. But that was not the same snow, I said. Our snow, our snow was not only shaken from whitewash buckets down the sky, it came shawling out of the ground and swam and drifted out of the arms and hands and bodies of the trees. Our snow grew overnight on the roofs of houses like a pure and grandfather moss minutely ivied the walls and settled on the postman opening the gate like a a dumb, numb thunderstorm of white, torn Christmas cards. Were there postmen then, too? With sprinkling eyes and wind-cherried noses, on spread frozen feet they crunched up to the doors and mittened on them manfully, but all that the children could hear was a ringing of bells. You mean the postman went rat-a-tat-tat and the door rang? No, I, I mean, the bells that the children could hear were inside them. I only hear thunder sometimes, never bells. Well, there were church bells, too. Inside them? No, no, no. In the bat black snow-white belfries, tugged by bishops and storks. And they rang their tidings over the bandaged town, over the frozen foam of the powder and ice cream hills, over the crackling sea, it seemed that all the churches boomed for joy under my window. And the weathercocks crew for Christmas on our fence. Get back to the postmen. Well, they were just ordinary postmen, fond of walking and dogs and Christmas and snow. They walk, they 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 walked, and they knocked on the doors with blue knuckles. Ours has got a black knocker. Well, and then they stood on the white welcome mat in the little drifted porches and huffed and puffed, making ghosts with their breath and jogged from foot to foot like small boys wanting to go out. And then the presents? And then the presents after the Christmas box and the cold postman with a rose on his button nose tingled down the tea tray slithered run of the chilly glinting hill. He went in his ice-bound boots like a man on fishmonger's slabs. He waggled his bag like a frozen camel's hump, dizzily turned the corner on foot, and by God, he was gone. Get back to the presents. Well, there were 
the useful presents, engulfing mufflers of the old coach days and mittens made for giant sloths and zebra scarfs of a substance like silky gum that could be tug of war down to the galoshes, blinding tam shanters like patchwork tea cozies and bunny-suited busbies and balaclavas for victims and from aunts who always wore wool next to the skin there were mustached and rasping vests that made you wonder why the aunts had any skin left at all and once once i had a little crocheted nose bag from an aunt now alas no longer whinnying with us and the pictureless books the pictureless books in which small boys, though worn with create quotations not to wood, skate on Farmer Giles' pond, and did, and drowned. And books that told me everything about wasps, except why. Go, go on to the useless presents. Tell me about the useless presents. Well, bags of moist and many colored jelly babies and a folded flag, and a false nose, and a tram conductor's cap, and a machine that punched tickets and rang a bell. Never a catapult. Once, by a mistake, no one could ever explain a little hatchet, and a celluloid duck that made when you pressed it a most unduck-like sound, a, a mewing moo that an ambitious cat might make who wished to be a cow and a painting book in which I could make the grass, the trees, the sea, and the animals any color I please. And still the dazzling sky blue sheep are grazing in the red field under the rainbow build and pea green birds. Hard boils, toffee, fudge of all sorts, crunches, cracknel, humbugs, glaciers, marzipan, and butter Welsh for the Welsh and troops of bright tin soldiers who, if they could not fight, could always run, and snakes and families and happy ladders, and easy hobby games for little engineers complete with instructions, and a whistle to make the dogs bark, to wake up the old man next door, to make him beat on the wall with his stick and shake our picture off the wall, and a pack of cigarettes. You put one in your mouth, and you stood at the corner on the street, and you waited for hours in vain for some old lady to scold you for smoking a cigarette and then with a smirk you ate it. Always then, on Christmas night, there was music. An uncle played the fiddle. A cousin sang Cherry Ripe. And another uncle sang Drake's Drum. It was very warm in the little house. Auntie Hannah, who had got on to the parsnip wine, sang a song about bleeding hearts and death, and then another in which she said her heart was like a bird's nest, and then everybody laughed again. And then I went to bed. Looking through my bedroom window, out into the moonlight and the unending smoke-colored snow, I could see the lights in the windows of all the other houses on our hill and hear the music rising from them up the long, steadily falling night. I turned the gas down. I got into bed. I said some words to the close and holy darkness. And then I slept. Friends, in this joyful and complicated season, as the light begins to return, even while still we dwell in a close and a holy darkness, may that piece of the past in some way be yours, whether real or imagined, whether Dylan Thomas was faithfully recounting his childhood or weaving a tail out of cobweb snow. May that peace that passes understanding settle too on our bones, just as the snow might settle out there if it was snowy this year. 
and may the quiet that comes in snowfall, the way that all the sharp edges of the world get rounded over, the way that the furthest distant sound comes closer and closer until the whole world is hardly the size of a backyard. May that peace, that tranquility, and that stillness settle on our hearts this season. Amen. Our musical response is Bells in the High Tower. This by Jess Hudeman, who's a music director at a Unitarian congregation in Providence, Rhode Island, Bell Street Chapel. This month, our offering goes to support the programs of this congregation. You can make a donation now using the link posted in our chat by, or by sending a check to UUCB. I invite you to give as generously as you are able.
And may our gifts be used to enact justice, bringing peace and love to the Boulder community. We extinguish our chalice this morning. We extinguish our chalice this morning and the flame there goes out, but continues to live in each of us, warming us from the inside out, shining, reminding us of who we are and who we're called to be. Friends, go in peace and be a blessing on the world. Amen. Thank you to all who have gathered this morning. And now, as always, we invite you to stay with us in the Zoom rooms for a time of online fellowship and discussion. Jennifer will be putting those together. And when you get the invitation, please join. <laughs>